you ever wondered how much protein there really is? Not that type of protein per se, but researchers are always finding ways to detect protein levels in different cells. Western blot is a lab technique that is used to detect if specific types or forms of proteins are present, and the amounts of proteins made when comparing it to different cell types. Each cell essentially makes different types of proteins that can help them complete different actions and activities. And now when we think back to the central dogma, we know that we start off at DNA to RNA to protein. It's ultimately genes or the cell's DNA that dictates what proteins are made and the activities of the cell. The main questions researchers are trying to answer when using Western blots are how does the modifications on the gene change the protein production? How do genetically different cell lines differ in protein production? And how do chemical inducers influence cell function? All in saying, cell proteins are the best indicators of the cell's function and growth. Western blots are ultimately a race amongst proteins. The larger and heavier proteins will be higher up on the gel, whereas the smaller and lighter proteins will be lower on the gel as they are faster. This way we can identify proteins based on their size and weight. The whole protein mixture from cells are loaded at the top of the gel and it runs down the gel towards the positively charged side. This is an extremely simplified explanation of western blots, but the main idea is gel electrophoresis is used to separate and identify proteins based on weight. Western blots can sometimes get overwhelming. It's like reading a graph with five axes that you have to take into consideration simultaneously. Here I will present four steps that you can take when reading western blots and how to interpret the information. Now take a look at this western blot diagram and get used to it because we'll be breaking it down. Just as a disclaimer for animation purposes, the western blot appears to have a black background with white lines on it. Uh, most cases western blots have a white background with black lines so just invert the colors but on occasions when western blots are testing for fluorescent proteins then you will see a black background with colored fluorescent lines. Axis number one is a top horizontal axis. It tells readers what cell lines are being used and how the experimental groups are different from each other. In most cases, it will include details like genetic modifications, like gene knock-ins or gene knock-outs. Familiarize yourself with the common abbreviations like the plus sign and the minus sign and what they are referring to. Now let's add what we know to our results table. Experimental groups in this case will be the homozygous ABC gene carrying cells versus the homozygous non ABC carrying cells. A tip for reading axis number one is Google may seem like your best friend, but feeling the need to know every single thing about cell lines and the gene's functions or mechanisms is not required. Do not overwhelm yourself with information, because in this case, information can act like a double-edged sword and can block your ability to interpret information and data unbiasedly. Now moving on to axis number two, or what I like to call the chemical gateway to heaven. Here the readers will learn about what chemicals are being added to the cell. Now it's important to think about how your chemicals might affect the cell's protein production. Will it favor protein production of protein A versus protein X are some questions you can ask yourself. Here the control lane refers to the cell with no chemicals added. Here we get to see what the cell's normal behavior or its natural protein producing state is. But when we look over here, researchers are adding both chemicals. Now you might be asking, why are they adding both chemicals if there's already two other experimental lanes where the chemicals have been added? Knowing what the chemicals will do to the cell independently is important, but we also need to know how the chemicals will react with each other. Do they amplify or override each other's effects are questions we might answer when looking at this lane. Of course, let's not forget to add this information into the results table. Remember how Google was not as important for the first axis? Well, let's do the complete opposite for axis number two. I encourage you to do a deep dive and stock every aspect of the chemicals. 
finding mechanisms and what the chemicals target, specifically which organs or cellular pathways they affect, is very important. It's also important to follow along with the thought processes of the researchers. Why did they use these chemicals? Specifically, what environmental conditions are the researchers trying to replicate through the use of these chemicals? And oftentimes, most answers are right under your nose. So make sure to read the article thoroughly. Axis number three, the protein legend. This tells the readers what each line means protein-wise. It's essentially a legend that's created in reference to a protein database, a dictionary where each protein has its respective weights stated. For now, I have written numbers, but later on I'll specify what protein each horizontal axis means. Don't forget that the thickness of white lines is also an indicator of the protein levels, high or low, thick or thin. Now jumping on to axis number four, because we will return to axis number three in a bit, Axis number four is optional, but very important axis. Great research will always have control groups, ways to prove the validity of their results. That all chemicals, cells, or techniques that they're using are sound and have not gone bad. So Western block controls are a little bit different than other experimental controls you've probably heard of. Remember how we said Western blocks involved protein loading on the gel? Well. How do we know each cell or each experimental group has equal amounts of protein mixture loaded? Actually, think of it like this. So we know that the red cell makes double the amount of heart protein than the yellow cell. If our control lanes are properly done, so if we have equal amounts of each cell's proteins being put in, then we should see that the red cell lane has a white line that's two times thicker than the yellow cell for heart protein. But if the control lanes are unfair, for example, the yellow cell has two times more protein mixture loaded, then it will appear as if the yellow cell makes two times more protein than the red cell, when in reality it's just because the yellow cells had more proteins loaded on the gel. In sum, a good control lane will have equally thick lines. If they're extremely varying in the line thickness, then I would be very skeptical about those results. Back to axis number three. Let's get to reading the actual results. This blot is detecting the presence of protein X, Y, and Z. Using your hand as a guide, let's look at the protein production of an ABC carrying cell when chemical C1 is added. Reading vertically, we see that white lines appear at the three protein horizons, and we see a slightly thicker line at protein Z. Moving on to the next lane, an ABC gene carrying cell with a chemical C2 added instead has the presence of protein X and Y, but no protein Z is detected. Now let's do one more lane together. ABC carrying cell with both chemicals added has high levels of protein X, low levels of protein Z, and no protein Y produced. We'll continue to do this with the rest of the chart and fill up the results table. The most important part, putting meaning to the white lines. Making general conclusions can take some time, but it's important to look for patterns of protein production between chemicals within the same experimental group and across experimental groups. ABC cells with C2 don't make protein Z, but non-ABC cells with C1 instead don't make protein Z. In this case, protein Z production is inhibited, but with different chemicals. Here are some other patterns I've noticed. When we add both chemicals, C1 and C2, to a non-ABC gene, there's the complete inhibition of all proteins. Another remark that I've saw or pattern is ABC cells with both chemicals added we see that C1 overrides C2's inhibition of protein Z, but for some reason when they're together, they all of a sudden inhibit protein Y. It's kind of interesting and something I wanted to note down. When we look at the actual role of ABC genes in protein production, you noticed that with no ABC, 
and both chemicals, all proteins are inhibited. But once you add in the ABC gene with both chemicals, we all of a sudden see the production of protein X and Z. So in this case, we can make a prediction that ABC gene has some sort of connection to the production of protein X and Z. Things to focus on during interpretations are areas of super thick lines, optimal protein production, thin lines, empty areas as an in inhibition. This will help direct you so you know what you're looking for. Time to put your knowledge to the test. Remember, you always have to read the caption of figures to decipher any unknown abbreviations. Of course, this example is not something that can possibly be done using Western blots unless I don't know about it, but it will test your ability to read and interpret results. Following the checklist, read the caption, identify abbreviations and unknowns, what do chemicals do, how do they influence tree cells, is a controlling valid, are there equally thick lines, then set up a results table like I showed you before and fill it in. Then finally you can interpret the results. And remember, keep the key words in mind. Thick, thin, optimal, inhibition. Those are what you want to look out for. And if you truly want to test your Western blot skills, then think about the entire experiment. What was the goal of the researchers? And brainstorm some experimental tests that the researchers could do in the future. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So, the researchers in this case wanted to see the effects of, I guess, hormones in trees and how it affects the fruit production. My question would be, why did the researchers limit themselves to using only growth factor hormone? They could have knocked out or knocked in other hormones. So that's another example of possible future experiments they should play around with. Also, think about what you wish the researchers addressed. What didn't make sense to you? Were there any holes in the whole experiment? These questions apply to all data sets. They're not restricted to Western blots. So critically thinking will enhance your ability to independently read articles and not so much mindlessly follow behind researchers and what they've concluded. Here's your summary sheet based off of the practice question that I've given in the video. Feel free to think of more general conclusions that I haven't come up with and pause the video to screenshot this or if you look in our description box you can find a PDF link for a higher quality picture. And as always, keep translating science. See you later!